Hello. We're starting our video today just a little bit differently. I want you to see the man behind these videos who does all the setup and all the recording and all the editing and makes me look fair to Midland good. My husband Dan, the pastor of Calvary Free Lutheran Church in Mesa, Arizona. For those of you who are watching and listening in other places, we just want to say Merry Christmas from our house to yours and our heart to your hearts. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Welcome to session 16 of Living by Faith Today based on Hebrews chapter 11. Today let's start with our platform of belief. Number one, I believe God is who he says he is. I believe God has done what he says he has done. I believe God will do what he says he will do. Amen. All faith steps off of that platform. Today we're going to look at Hebrews 11, starting at verse 32. I'm going to read through the first part of 35, although we will not cover all of that today. It is the beginning of our conclusion to the book of Hebrews. Before we get into it, I would like to call attention to the little decoration that I have this week because I, I chose it thoughtfully. I, um, I have great fun going around my house and choosing different things each week to put here. But this week I chose this cabin. I, don't, I hope you can see it. Be, my husband gave that to me several years ago because it, it was at the time almost an exact likeness to the little cabin in the woods that my sister had just bought. Now you'd have to picture it with things coming off the top and both sides and the back because she's been adding on and remodeling for years. But the front entrance, the front porch, and the core of the house still looks exactly like that. And to me, that's home. If I go home, that's where I go now. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful, warm memory for me. And I have placed angels around the house. Uh, hiding behind trees, but, but all around the house on purpose because I want to call attention to the fact that ordinary Christians in ordinary houses living ordinary lives have all of heaven at their disposal. And we'll look at that more today. Okay, so starting with verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, I like that one, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, and women received back their dead by resurrection. So here we have a, a list to end the teaching now on faith, a, a list of people and men from the Old Testament who exhibited wonderful faith, powerful faith that accomplished tremendous miracles. And we're going to take a look at that. Maybe not at every single name for the sake of time, but starting today, we're going to look at Gideon. But I'm coming at this from an interesting point of view. It struck me as I read through these names and began reading their stories in the Old Testament this week that they all have one thing in common that is interesting and was of great comfort to me. And that is given in verse 34. It says, these people were all made strong out of weakness. This is a list by and large of men who exhibited great weakness from time to time in their lives spiritual weakness, deep doubt, or moral weakness, falling into grievous sins, um, what have you. And it's a fascinating tale. That is not what God chose to take out of their lives and, and put in his book. He put them in his great hall of faith and fame for coming through with faith in spite of great weakness. And I found a lot of comfort in that. It's interesting to me and comforting to me, and I, I hope that it will be the same to you. Let's start with Gideon. I'm going to go back to Judges chapter 6. And you will find the story of Gideon in Judges 6 and 7. 
and I suggest that you read it on your own this week. It's fascinating. There's so much there. What a character. Um, I'm not going to tell, like it says right in Hebrews, not going to take the time to tell you all about it because we just don't have the time. He says, time would fail me. Um, but do read it for yourself. And I will read some from the story of Gideon to you. I think that we aren't going to get farther than Gideon today. It isn't going to be that way every time we're together. I can promise you that. But the life of Gideon and God working in Gideon to build up his faith, and he kept coming to God with such weakness, it spoke, it spoke so to my heart that I want to share that with you today. Um, the people in Gideon's day, this was the day of the judges. It was a dark time in Israel's history. They had no king, no ruler. They were in the promised land. They were trying to conquer kingdoms and take over the promised land and, and growing in numbers greatly, but they had no ruler. They had no government. They, the book of Judges itself says uh, it was complete anarchy. Every man was for himself and did whatever he wanted to do. And I'm sure you know that means that sin ruled because without checks and balances and without a system of, of laws and government, the old nature has a heyday and sin rules. So um, God would, every few hundred years, call on somebody to govern for a time and see if he could bring his people back to center. Um, and one of these men was Gideon, and we're going to look at him today. Now, the people of Midian are surrounding Israel. They vastly outnumber Israel. It says in chapter 6, um, verse, starting with verse 2, The hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep, no ox, no donkey. They would come up with their livestock and their tents like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted and they laid waste the entire land. So here's poor little Israel without a king, without government, a mass of people in the wilderness or in the promised land, but um, kind of wilderness living to tell you the truth by this point in time. And they're surrounded on all sides by a vast army so big that they couldn't even count the camels, much less the soldiers. And they were decimating Israel. It says Israel had to go dig out dens and caves to, to live safely. And they had no food. It was terrible. And they cried out to the Lord. And the Lord sent a prophet. And the prophet said, God's, God does have a message for you. God says he has tried repeatedly to deliver you and help you, starting with bringing you out of Egypt. And it recounts some other miraculous interventions of God. And then God says, but you don't follow me out of trouble. I look back over my shoulder and you're not following me out. He says, I, what more can I do for you? But God does do more for them because they cried out to him. He calls on Gideon to deliver Israel from this vast army. Looking at the call of Gideon is interesting. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord, and that by the way is Jesus, came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abia's right, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But it looks to me like the Lord has forsaken us and has delivered us into the hand of Midian. Haven't you felt like that sometimes? If God is for me, why is all this happening to me? Um, you can think of it politically in terms of our whole land. You can think of it in your own life when things just go wrong and they stay going wrong for a long time and you don't see a lot of answers to prayer, if any. And I've asked that question. God have we slipped out from under your hand of blessing? Have you removed your hand from us? Have we, have we sinned in some way? Are we off on the wrong track? 
why don't you take care of us anymore like you used to? Well, the answer is always, hang on, I'm there. And of course, eventually prayers are answered and things are made right. But I could relate with that, you know, God himself appears to Gideon and Gideon says, well, if, if it's really you and you really are for us, why are we living in such distress? That's a valid question. But God has an answer. Verse 14, and the Lord turned to Gideon and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? Isn't it enough that I, God himself, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I, Jehovah God, Yahweh, the great I am, have appeared before you and, and I'm sending you. Isn't that enough for you? Well, it wasn't. And he said, oh, Lord, I can't do that. I, my clan is the weakest and I am the least in my father's house. I am not up to the task. I, I can't do this. Verse 16, and the Lord said to him, but, I love the word but, it's one of the most powerful words in the entire Bible, but I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. He said that whole vast army that you can't even count is going to fall as though they were only one man because I will fight with you and in you and for you and with me, you're a majority. Well, Gideon was still full of doubt. And he said, you've got to prove it to me, God. I, I just don't see it. Gideon had no problem with his belief system. He, he believed that God was who he said he was, that God had done what he said he had done. And even that God would do in the future what he promised to do. Where Gideon had a problem was, but will he do it for me? And that is where I come into the picture. I just have to say, I have shared that doubt with Gideon many times. Oh, I believe, folks. I believe. I can preach it. <laughs> and when I look over my shoulder, I see all the wonderful answers to prayer and all the times God has come through for me and for my family and, and for their mission work and for our local church and what have you, you know, miracle after miracle. And then I turn and face the front and see the new crisis coming down the road and I'm, and I'm just my heart just sinks and I think, oh Lord, I believe, but can you do it for me one more time? And let's see what happens. So God gives him permission to, okay, I'll prove it to you. So Gideon goes and prepares a, a goat and, and some cakes and bread and, and God says, remember, it is Jehovah God who is appearing before him. Because remember, it says the angel of the Lord, but then when the angel of the Lord speaks in verse 16, it says, and the Lord Jehovah God, the great I am, said to him, he was having a conversation with God who had appeared before him in human form. And that's why we know it was Jesus. And he says, he gives Gideon permission to, to this test. So Gideon brings this food and the Lord says, um, put it over there in that rock and pour, pour the broth all over them. Soak it with broth. And so Gideon did that. And then verse 21, then the angel of the Lord, it was God himself, reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. Fire sprang up from the rock and consumed it all in one big whoosh. And then it says, and then the Lord disappeared from his sight. So he gave Gideon he had appeared before him. He had given him two or three verbal promises by this time in the conversation. And then he does this mighty miracle in front of him, all to bolster Gideon's faith. Never a scolding or a censure for him. Oh, you puny faithed person. I am disappointed in you, Gideon. That is nowhere here at all. I want you to notice that all the way through the story. Verse 22, then Gideon perceived that he had seen the angel of the Lord. Verse 25. That night the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord. So God was saying, I am going to use you to deliver the entire nation of Israel, but we have to start in your own backyard. 
you've got your father has these huge idols on his property. Tear them down and put an altar up to me, and then we'll get started. Well, he did it, but he's still weak and full of doubts and some fears because it says, verse 27, so Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he snuck out and did it by night. <laughs> you know, that is a very interesting example to me. Um, you know, the Bible just records things as they are. He just was afraid. He believed God. He believed it was God who had appeared to him. He believed that God had called him to deliver Israel, but he was still full of, of fear and self-doubt, even after all of the reassurances and miracles God had given him. But he did it anyway. And you know, that's actually the definition of courage. Do it afraid. If you can't conquer your fear, do it anyway. That's courage. If we... If we weren't afraid, if there was no danger, if there was nothing that we felt we had to face and muster ourselves up to do, courage isn't needed. But all through the teaching on faith, God says, take courage, use courage, be courageous. Well, Gideon did it afraid, but we still, and good for him, but we still see that he is full of self-doubt. Well, after the altar is destroyed, um, God comes to Gideon again. I'm going to start with verse 33. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. Again, they're camped all around Israel, ready to attack, ready to snuff out this small band of people. Verse 34, but, oh, you're going to learn to love that word, but, the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. And Gideon sounded the trumpet and rallied Israel to, to his defense and formed an army. But that, that verse, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. Your Bible might use different words there because for some reason, not all versions uh, translate that word clothed as a reflexive. But if you look it up in the Hebrew, it's a reflexive. The word is clothed himself. He didn't clothe Gideon with the Holy Spirit. He didn't empower, necessarily empower Gideon. He didn't come upon Gideon. He so entered Gideon that it said he, the Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. Gideon was just the skin and the Spirit of God rose up in Gideon that strongly. Is That's a powerful thing. You know, I pray that for my husband all the time. Oh, Holy Spirit, clothe yourself in Dan today as he goes out to minister in your name. I was first taught that in Bible school by Pastor Maynard Force, and it has impressed me all the years of my adult life, and I have prayed that prayer. Um, Anyway, looking now at Gideon, it's one more example of, the, of God just manifesting himself to Gideon. We've had, let's see, we've had the God himself appearing before Gideon and assuring him that it was him and calling him in, into service. Um, we've had the, the, the angel of the Lord, God himself, uh, devoured by, by miraculous fire, his offering, and then disappeared from sight. And, and here we have this tremendous, empowering, uh, divine, holy empowering to the point that it said Gideon was just the clothes over the Holy Spirit. And then we have verse, after all of that, verse 36. O oh Lord, says Gideon, if you really are going to save Israel by my hand, as you have said, I need to see more signs. I, I, to me, it's a little bit hard to understand why he hasn't had enough signs by now until I look at my own heart and I realize all the times that I have responded to God with doubt and fear. Not that God isn't who he says he is or that he hasn't done what he says he will do or that he won't do what he promises to do. 
I have a strong faith in that, a strong belief in that. My problem is, but will he do it for me? I believe he'll do it for you. Amen. But will he do it for me? And I falter and I flounder and I start to worry and stress about things because I, I wonder if this great and mighty God who's appeared to me so many times and given me so many verbal promises, just like he did with Gideon, will actually be there for me in the trenches. It's, it's really pathetic. But God is every bit as patient with me as he was with Gideon. So Gideon gives God two more signs for God to do. One is, it's this fleece we talk about so much. The first one is that God make it, I think this is the right order. Yeah, make it completely bone dry overnight. And I'm going to put a piece of wool, fleece wool or a piece of wool out on the ground. And I want that wool to be soaked with water and everything else dry. Well, they get up in the morning and God had done that bone dry, except it said that he could wring a whole bowl of water out of his little piece of wool. So, wow, thank you, God. But still wasn't enough. Gideon said, let's do it one more time. I want to really be sure that you're going to come through for me before I commit to this, God. This time, make the ground soaking wet and my little piece of wool bone dry. Well, in the morning, that's the way it was. And Gideon had to had to say, okay, God, this is really you, and you are really calling plain old me, and you will enable me and fight for me and with me. Well, <laughs> that's just great. But then God does a surprising thing. You know, really, on one hand, it's poor Gideon, what this man went through. On the other hand, wow, you know, to see so much of the face and hand of God, it's a wonderful thing. God told Gideon, okay, ready to fight. You've got 32,000 men that answered your call that are ready to fight. I want you to reduce your army to 300. And there was an interesting way to do that, but Gideon did that. They re he reduced his army to 300 men. Now Gideon's army, the army of Israel, has been reduced from 32,000 to 300. Um, but God wasn't quite done helping Gideon with his faith. Gideon wasn't quite ready. He was still full of doubts and worries. And that same night, verse 9 of chapter 7, that same night is when they reduced the army, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down into the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are still afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. So he did. God knows he's still afraid. He's still full of self-doubts. Can I do this thing? Is God going to come through for me after all that God has done for him? He struggles with this weakness of self-doubt. And so he goes, takes his servant and they sneak into the camp at night and he hears a dream. Let me read this to you. Um, I'll start with verse 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. And remember, Gideon has 300 men. When Gideon came, behold, he heard a man telling a dream to his comrade. And the man said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, who beholds? He's pretty impressed with this dream. A cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down and the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, Ah, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And they completely routed this vast, numberless army. You know, it, God finally brought Gideon to the place where Gideon could grab a hold of his belief and act on it. That he had more faith in God than he had doubts about himself. But look at the way God brought him there. 
with so many reassurances and miracles and signs and promises. And finally, this last one where he says, go, I've, I've given a dream to these guys that's going to tell you what's going to happen. Go down and over, overhear it and uh, you'll be filled with faith by that point. And that's what God said. And so Gideon does, and it's kind of like the last step his little faith needed to, to become strong enough for the task. And then he saw the future as though it were today. And he, first of all, he worships. That's significant because after every other time God has appeared to him or spoken to him, he has responded with, but, but, but God, I, I don't think I can do this. This time he worshiped. It was enough. And uh, then he says, the Lord has given the Midianites into our hand. Well, it hadn't happened yet. They hadn't fought the battle yet. Midian was still numberless surrounding them on all sides. But now faith saw the unseen. Faith saw the invisible army of God all around them. And he knew with God they were the majority in number. Faith saw the future result. And he spoke as though it were happened that day. God has already given it to us. Let's go. Well, and God had and those 300 men completely defeated the, the vast army. So to me, the secret here of these this list of people in Hebrews, the last part of Hebrews 11, is that they shared weaknesses. The, the faith they exhibited, if you read the, if you remember the list we read, and you can read it again for yourself, was it's all over the map. Some did that, some accomplished that, some accomplished that, some accomplished that, but they all share one thing. They came to God in weakness. And sometimes it was moral failure, sin. Sometimes it was doubting God. Sometimes it was doubting themselves. And God met them where they were. That's, that's what I love about, about this. He just met them where they were and helped their faith to grow until it was at the place where they and God together could do that thing. And that's a wonderful thing. So, um, I want to leave you with a couple of verses. Are you doubting today that God can come through for you? I know that I'm, in a sense, preaching to the choir, and that's a wonderful thing. You know the Lord, and you know his word, and we're walking this journey together. Um, but I also know that there are some of you who, like me, struggle with this particular weakness of, but can God do it for me? Will he do it for me? I know he can do it. I know he'll do it for you. Boy, do I pray for you with faith and power. <laughs> but will he do it for me? Well, let me just leave you with a couple of verses from the Lord. First one is Isaiah 42, verse 3. I love this verse. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench, but he will faithfully bring forth justice. I love that. If your faith is floundering in any way, if, if you have some weaknesses and flaws, join the club, get in line. God isn't going to scold you or spank you until it's, you know, completely dead and you don't want anything more to do with him. He's going to fan that flame and bring it back to to where it should be. He's going to gently strengthen your faith with promises and experiences until you and God together are ready to rise up. Um, it's a wonderful thing. So if you're a bruised reed or a faintly burning wick today, take courage and take encouragement. God knows that and he loves you and he's going to help you. The second verse is Matthew 8:23. No, Matthew 8, I'm sorry, 2 and 3. <laughs> and behold, again, behold, that means listen up because I'm about to say something really magnificent here. Behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. In other words, he's saying, I know you have the ability to heal. I don't doubt that at all. You are the Lord and you can heal. But are you willing to heal me? That's his question. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and saying, oh yes, 
I am willing to heal you. Be clean. And the man was healed of his leprosy. So whatever you're facing today, God will help you. He will strengthen your faith. He will gently lead you to the place where he wants you to be. And then he will indeed use you. He is willing to touch you, to heal you, to deliver you, and to strengthen and help your faith. Well, that brings us to the end of our study today. We didn't get any farther than Gideon, but when we pick this up again, we will start with the rest of the list of men and look at their weaknesses, and we won't spend a week on each man. It'll go faster after this. Um, we won't, however, be here next Friday or the Friday after because that's Christmas Day and New Year's Day. The week after Christmas, uh, my husband and I will be in Mexico visiting our son and our grandchildren there, so please pray for us. The trip to Mexico is always a little bit um, insecure, not only because of the coronavirus traveling internationally, but because of the drug situation in Mexico right now, the cartels. Um, we're fairly safe flying, and we're fairly safe in the city where Danny lives, but we do appreciate prayer support. I want you to check out uh, a YouTube song when we're done here, please. I, it's, let's see, what you should, what you should uh, Google up, either go to YouTube and do it in their search engine or just to, to Google, is Bill and Gloria Gaither, uh, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I want to make sure I got that right. Bill and Gloria Gaither, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Use those words and it will take you to the most lovely song that Bill sings about trusting God and coming to him from a point of weakness. I hope it'll bless your heart the way it's blessed mine. So until January 8th, bye.